So as it turns out, Goldman Sachs has an open source or open development quantitative finance uh, Python package, which I find really interesting. You can see here that they have like a developer page and they have a bunch of solutions here in the docs. They have this GS quant, which is their Python toolkit for quantitative finance, which I find really interesting. And I was poking around in here and I was looking for um, some examples or some tutorials and I'll get to that in a minute. I just wanted to show you that they do have a GitHub repository page as well that you can go in and take a look at um, some of the things that they're doing here, uh, some of the requirements and how to install it. And when I was exploring this, I saw, ah, excellent examples. And I clicked on it and it brought me to this page. And I said, oh, okay, I'll keep looking around. And I poked my way through some of this stuff here and I eventually landed on this Jupyter Notebook page that had several different types of um, Jupyter Notebooks where GSQuant was used. And I found this one really interesting. So this Jupyter Notebook here was looking at, um, I think the last um, election cycle. And it just does a pretty interesting analysis of the FX markets based on the before and after data of the last US election cycle. So I know that this year is a US election cycle, so it might be kind of interesting to go through this again. Um, of course, I don't have the kind of data that Goldman Sachs has, and it does look like in order to do this, you do need like a session with Goldman Sachs. And if I'm being honest, it does look like you need to create an account in order to get some of the product features that they talk about on this website here for developers. But nevertheless, um, I did want to go through this because I briefly looked over it and I thought, you know, I think these guys would be pretty interested in some kind of quantitative finance like this. Um, you can see here that um, GSQuan has data sets that you can import. Um, obviously, it does look like they have um, some modules for importing assets and the identifiers for those assets in their security master. A security master is typically like a company's main database for all the different securities that pass through their, their um, institution. So um, this security master is Goldman Sachs, which I imagine is pretty widespread and has most securities out there considering they're one of the major players in the markets. They do have a date time module. It looks like they have an API for the data. Um, this is Fred data API, and I'm not exactly sure what that's pulling. We'll find out a little bit uh, below. They, of course, uh, wouldn't be a quant module uh, or it wouldn't be a quant SDK if they didn't have a time series uh, module here or package. And it looks like they have returns and diff. And then they're grabbing sklearn for PCA, matplotlib, and some of the other usual suspects. Looks like they create a session, and this is how you would typically go about it if you had a client ID and a secret, a client secret, so that you could do some analytics or read product data. And you can see they're going to look at the current macro landscape and understand how the risk has evolved in the last six months through the lens of PCA, or principal component analysis. Um, so what we'll talk about first is the data, PCA, interpreting the top two risk drivers. And then I'm assuming this is like they're going to test out the returns um, based on the realized data versus what the predicted is based on the PCA analysis. Um, OK, so let's just get into it. So let's look at the data. It looks like they can pull volatility from the GS data catalog. And I tried looking through their catalog. But unfortunately, you do need like a user ID and an account to look at that catalog. Um, it looks like they can pull volatility data from it, though. And we can probably see it here. So they're grabbing FX spot, IRS spot, volatility, and the volatility from there. Um, I'm not sure what the IR swap rates are here. So they're defining a, a start date and an end date. 
and you know that's pretty typical stuff here but here they're grabbing GS datasets and this is the list of datasets that they're grabbing it looks like and um, then they're putting it through these so it looks like they're getting the FX spot rate the X FX volatility IRS spot IR volatility and then they get the data based on the start and end date they're getting the uh, Euro USD, USD Japan, yada, yada, yada. Looks like if this is the time uh, interval, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, it sort of cuts off at the end here, so I don't know exactly what goes on after that. And then they turn it into a pivot table and plot it. So this is what it looks like. Um, I don't need to go into the specifics of how they got to this image. You know, it's 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 all right here. But you can see this is just the time series plotting of the FX rates, um, or the, excuse me, the FX volatility across the years, right? You can see in 2020, it went way, way, way up, uh, but that's to be expected. Looks like back here, there was like a, a bear market, but then we had a, a good good bull run in this, in this period of time. Cool. So, um, or excuse me, this is volatility. I need to get that through my head. This is the first time I'm looking at this. So this is the volatility of the FX rates um, across time. So you can see it was really volatile around this period, which I wonder what happened around this period. Um, cool. So we get that. So they do the same thing with the implied rate volatility for each of the FX rates as well. Looks a little bit different, right? All right, and then it looks like they use the FRED API key. You insert your key here, and then you grab the API, and they're getting the VIX. Okay, so they're just getting the um, Federal Reserve something data, I'm guessing, um, and they're pulling the VIX on that. And VIX is an index for volatility as well. So they've essentially pulled three different volatility met, uh, three different volatilities here um, for different FX, different currencies, and then as a whole. So now we move on to the PCA. Uh, let's now look across the number of macro series to run PCA, understanding what's driving risk here. So it looks like instruments, they're setting the instruments, the equities, commodities, rates, FX, credit, fundamentals. They're doing the FRED symbols here. They're setting some color mapping here. Um, and then they're setting the real volatility window, asset map, data frame. So it looks like they're going to, yep, do some for loops where they go through. And um, looks like they're mapping X for each instrument item. OK, gotcha. Yikes. I'm not going to get too deep into this because it looks like what they're trying to do is just set a data frame for all the different instruments um, across the time that they grabbed um, and mapping it into the, you know, into the columns that they need. So it looks like, though, that with GS Quant, I want to just see, so instrument items, and they've defined instruments here okay and the items here okay gotcha so they've just created a few dictionaries they're going into the dictionaries and they're mapping that into um, their data frame it looks like and yeah cool and they're getting the volatility data and they're doing that for a bunch of different stuff here uh, gotcha and they're okay so they're calling get data over and over again on different things okay this is starting to make a little bit more sense to me um, cool. So then at the end of all that, it looks like they just have a pretty standard data frame of their instruments and the dates and the values of those instruments. In that data frame, they have 34 columns and the header is obviously five rows, but I'm assuming there's a lot more. Um, let's run a three-factor PCA for the last 260 days, rolling period, and record how much variance is explained by each component. So this is a pretty standard PCA analysis that they're doing here. Um, contribution to variance from each component. They have three components, one, two, three. So you can visualize the three 
components that are driving risk across or driving volatility across the years. Um, okay, that kind of makes sense. Now let's look at the top two components explaining the risk in 2020 as well as over a time period. Note components can rotate over time, so we look at the absolute ratios of PC1 and PC2 and vice versa. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, they trained the first model on the f full data set, and they trained the second model on just 2020, um, and then they plot it. And I kind of like the way that they plot this because they show, like, in a pretty typical, like, what you learn in school, the positive and negative, um, you know, graph settings here. And so this is pretty interesting. You kind of get an outlay of the two driving PCA um, components that um, affect each instrument. And you can kind of see that the like FX volatility is over here versus, um, looks like they have, the, okay, these are just different break-evens. Interesting. So these could not be farther apart. So you can see that PCA 1 and 2 are like complete opposite ends here for the, you know, 3M30 real uh, implied real implied volatility, all that good stuff. PCAs I find are so difficult to um, read the graphs that the graphs are typically pretty difficult to read here. Um, and I'm guessing this is just 2020 only. So this is like a similar setup up here, but it's only doing 2020 instead of the whole data set. And you can see here like which instruments get the most, um, I don't know, which, which are affected the most by the each component. And then they do some predictions versus actual. So I know I sort of ran out of gas toward the end here, but uh, if you want to take a look, um, GSQuant has a lot of interesting Jupyter notebooks that you can look through, and maybe even you might want to explore the uh, the GitHub repository here to see if you can you can learn some stuff. Anyway, I just quickly threw this together. Um, sorry if it's a sloppy video. I just wanted to get it out for you guys. Um, until next time, I'll see you then. Bye.